We're live from Las Vegas celebrating 10 years of reInvent. I'm Rudy Chetty and what do wings have to do with AWS history? Well, more than you can cluck about. Here's Corey Quinn in conversation with Jeff Barr, VP of AWS Evangelism. Hi there, I'm Corey Quinn, Chief Cloud Economist at the Duckbill Group, and this is Winging It. I'm joined today by VP and Chief Evangelist, Jeff Barr, who works at AWS. I need to be very clear on this. I don't work at AWS because they have hiring standards. Jeff, thank you for joining hey, us. Hey, happy to be here, Corey. So this is an elaborate setup where we have wings of unspecified hotness here. And the reason that we're doing this as a ridiculous game is because nothing at AWS ever seems simple. And this was the most straightforward path, believe it or not, to trick you folks into buying me lunch. So thank you, I appreciate that. Anytime. So you know, Corey, that Wings actually have a really respectable tradition within AWS and Amazon. There's been the chicken wing eating contest for years on stage. I think it set several world records successively year over year. One of the other things I do besides writing innumerable blog posts and social media is I get to meet with customers and share a bit of our culture. And usually that takes the form of here's our leadership principles and here's working backward and here's PRFAQs and so forth. But actually, Eating massive numbers of chicken wings is also part of our culture. And I think, think when we were thinking, how do we widely share our culture at reInvent, it was actually a natural thing to do. Uh, this is something that we've, we've all enjoyed doing. There's a, there's a competitive spirit to it. There's actually, uh, not only do you compete, but there are judges, and the judges have actual deep standards for what constitutes a fully consumed chicken wing. And the judges will actually carefully pick through your partially eaten wings and designate the ones you didn't actually go all the way through on. It's a little bit weird, but they we are a data-driven company, so it that's It sounds kind of bizarre, it or at least it would have years ago, but now I have a four-year-old, so when you start offering prizes for eating foods for picky eaters, it's, okay, we have to actually do some judging about what constitutes trying something versus not. Exactly, did you eat it or not? And so it, it started pretty small, and I think we got to the point where I started to worry about the actual scalability of the, the chicken wing sources, right? You always think about scalability at AWS, so. Oh, absolutely. For folks who might not be super well-informed about what it is I do, it distills down to basically making fun of AWS for a living. So I just want to point out how and much an act of bravery this is. I've given you basically a straight shot at poisoning me and making this a lot easier for you folks in years to come. Absolutely, for sure. But you know, Corey, you're a really valued member of our of our community, and you're a great customer. And I'm pretty sure we have an LP that says, "Don't poison your customers." So that we must would be never one of the new ones that was added. It's, it hasn't quite made the exactly. Lego uh, block build yet that you've done. Exactly. So I, I'd, I'd say customer obsession and keep your customers healthy would be would be super, super, super important. These are really good, actually. They are. I was wondering how spicy the first one was going to be, and it wasn't horrifying. <laughs> It's somewhere on the spectrum <laughs> We've got this great progression. Oh yeah, it goes somewhere on the spectrum between nuclear and, ooh, this spicy ketchup <laughs> is surprisingly spicy. I don't know if I can handle that. It, it, indeed. <laughs> so it, it's been a, a super fun time to have been through, now this will be reInvent number 10. I actually was thinking back to the first one. Um, before the first one, certainly we're all here within AWS and we're doing all these great things day to day. You can hear the customer successes, you can hear you can see the numbers growing, you can hear that things are happening. We announced the first reInvent. I remember writing that blog post and putting it out and getting all set to go. But it wasn't until I actually walked into the keynote room for the first time and there were, there were 6,000 empty chairs, because I got there pretty early to stake out my spot, that it, it suddenly hit me of this is the actual scale of AWS. And I, I can very distinctly remember that moment of like, hmm, this is, this is not just this weird thing we're doing online, this is real and we've got actual customers and all these people paid to show up and to listen to what we actually have to say here. I will say it's very strange to me having to introduce you in any real context because I have talked about AWS as part of my business for five years and I have never once had to answer the question of who is Jeff Barr? I have had to answer the question of who is Andy Jassy before he ascended but never who you are. You are, for better or worse, the absolute face of AWS for an awful lot of folks. Because as we're learning how these things work, uh, ideally well, but sometimes finicky. And how does this all fit together? How do I contextualize this? The docs are great as a general rule and getting better all the time, but 
there's no soul to them. There's no, <laughs> here's why you would use it. Here's the type of problem that, it, that it's designed to tackle. That's what your blog posts always were. It was, it was the heart of what a service was intended to do. Whether it achieved that exact aim when it was released and was exposed to customers in our grubby hands is a different story. But it, it, you were the best that I ever saw at painting the vision for AWS services. And now there are, at last count, depending on how you count, somewhere between two and 300 services, although I'm sure that by the time all the keynotes wrap up uh, at reInvent this week, we're going to be into the 400s, depending on how you count them. Again, I don't, how do you keep it all straight? Well, I'm not the only blogger. Well, first of all, thanks for all those really kind words. That's, that's really They were honest words. Whether they're kind or not, well, they, that's they up to the listener. They were sure kind. So, I've just really enjoyed explaining things. And I think everybody has their niche in life. It can take a long time for us to figure out exactly who we are and what our niche is. And I think it took me well into my 40s before I figured out, okay, the thing I'm actually good at is just diving deep into something, grokking it, and then just laying it out for regular people to understand. But I, I went through my, my 20s and 30s think, not knowing that was actually who I was. And I think there's a really good lesson there sometimes of you talk to a 20-something and they're like, I'm so confused, I don't know who I am, what I'm good at. Well, it can take a long time to actually figure that, that, figure that out. So it's, it's actually uh, okay. Now, what was your question again? <laughs> no, I think we got it. It's, it's, the thing that confuses me though is I understand in the context of blog posts, that's great. It's, you can sit there, you can load something into short-term cash, you can write a post about it, and then it's gone with the wind. That's, that's how I tend to do things. I imagine you're very similar. It, it actually respect. is true. But you're also more than that. You're a VP, you're the chief evangelist, but you're also what I would, I guess, describe as the AWS ombudsperson. When a customer is having a problem on social media somewhere and they tend to express that problem in artfully <laughs> constructed <laughs> phrases, you're generally there more often than you're not saying, I'm sorry you're having this problem, let me get you to someone who can help. And the fact that you are who you are at a company at the scale that AWS is at, and you're still wading in to help various randos like me in various <laughs> social media fora is just astonishing to me. It's, it's one of those, you can't possibly keep scaling like this, except somehow you have. Scaling is a real challenge. I, I call it personal scalability, and there's always just one of me, and there, there isn't a whole team behind the scenes that's pretending to be me somehow. That would be very, very weird. And How many Jeff's bar are there, exactly? Just, just, just the one, and sometimes not even, even that. But um, I really actually really enjoy what I do. It, it actually just comes down to that, that it's, it's really satisfying to be able to help out customers. And I, I always think that that one question, that one challenge might be the final piece in the chain or the, or the bridge that gets them from really cool idea, almost there, to now they're like this incredibly successful startup and they're, they're off and running and things are going awesome for them. So, to the whatever extent possible, I'd like to help out and make sure that, that we're not the bottleneck, I'm not the bottleneck, we're just solving those good problems for them. It's interesting seeing, like reading the tea leaves and trying to understand where your fingerprints are showing up behind the scenes. So I like to represent our customers. And one, one of the things is that I know that customers care a lot about CloudFormation support. And so every time I'm in a meeting, I say, I'm assuming you're gonna have CloudFormation support at launch, right? And sometimes like, yeah, of course we are. And sometimes like, well, here's, here's the deployment pipeline reasons or the dev reasons why it, it takes a little bit to get that in there. But I do try to understand what our customers need and to make sure that, that those are reflected. And for, for better or for worse, we, we often build these new services in a, a silo. And the, because the team wants to go from awesome idea to having it in front of customers in a, a very focused way, they are not always fully aware of what all the other dozens or hundreds of teams are, are doing or building at the same time. And one, one of the things I can do during speed storming especially is say, you're doing this amazing thing. Well, your peers are also doing this other amazing thing and you need to mix the chocolate and the peanut butter together and make this even cooler thing. And sometimes I'll say, yeah, that's great. We've already got that in our plan. Or sometimes I'll say, oh, that's amazing. We had no idea that was about to come. And for sure, that would be a, a really, really cool thing to, to, to work on. Generally what they'll say is that will make a really good fast follow. They, they, it's not often they're going to say, let's just hold everything. Jeff's idea is so amazing that we're just going to disrupt the whole process. But they will say, let's, let's take that into full consideration. How have you seen what services are being used for and how they're envisioned shift based upon what customers do with them? Wow. So 
the, the customers are the ones that often end up knowing more about the service than we do. And the way I think about it is we simply build it. And that's actually, you know, there, there's a lot of really hard work that goes into understanding the customer needs and defining the service and building it and deploying it and making it scalable and reliable and all the things that we always say, this is how it's got to be. But then we hand it off to the customers and the customers are the ones that really get to push the edges, push the limits in, in really, really interesting ways that we wouldn't, not that we wouldn't have thought of, but we're not using it day to day. So we're not necessarily as familiar with the fact that, okay, well, here's this great API call and it returns things in this format. And then you want to call this other API that's clearly the thing that you'd call second in a row and the parameters just don't match up. The output of A doesn't match up nicely with B. So getting that kind of direct feedback from customers is, is always, always helpful. You have a way of explaining things in a way that has never once come across <laughs> as condescending. And I've also never once picked up from you this hand wavy enterprise buzzword speak that is generally code for, we have no idea what we're <laughs> well, talking about. And we're I, hoping I, that you I don't pick up on that. I found myself writing something where I was hand waving at myself and I gave myself a pretty big slap down of like, I literally said, you have no idea what you're talking about. Like you don't get this, but you're somehow trying to pretend like you do. And it's like, that's not who I really want to be. I, I, when you talk about explaining, I, I was at a summit in Singapore a long time ago. This might have been seven, eight years ago at this point. And they, I was at the summit. These two developers come up and they come up, just said hi, you know, and I, and I love when people come up and, and just introduce themselves and, and chat. So Jeff, we're, we're two developers. We are from Vietnam and we, we love to read your blog post because English is not our first language, but you somehow communicate to us what you're writing about, but you're not talking down to us somehow, and we love that. And I, that absolute moment has just crystallized in my head is like, that's who I have to be, right? I'm not gonna ever dumb things down, but I'm, I'm kind of still writing for those two folks in this interesting way of that's, that's the exact thing that I have to aim for. I'm, I'm not gonna use baby words. I'm not gonna throw in a bunch of big words in my vo vocabulary just to the show that I, I might know them, but I, I just want to be, make it really understandable and approachable. And if you come in and you have a medium amount of understanding, great, hopefully I can Im increase it. If you already know what, you're go what, you, what I'm talking about, you can skip the first paragraph or two and just jump right into the, this is what we're doing now kind of part. It's, it, it seems on some level to me that if you are not able to explain something simply to the point where it can be easily understood, you don't really understand it yourself. Oh, absolutely. So I think that there's an awful lot of insight and wisdom into how these things work that informs your blog posts. It takes far more work to explain something in a way that someone's never touched it before. I have to actually explain it to myself. Like if, if I don't get it, then the audience is never gonna get it. And so effectively part of the process is me figuring out what is, what is this all about and for the most part, that's just me reading about it and then using it. But if, if I'm still puzzled, I'll go to the team and I won't just ask for explanations. I, I will say, you know, let's, can I talk to your, your principal engineer and have them actually explain it to me at whatever level of tech they would like to go to. I, I, I can still pretty much hold my own when they're like, oh, let, let's go really, really deep down to the bare metal on this. I'm, I'm happy to actually go there with them. So, <laughs> When you were originally writing those very first blog posts for SQS and S3, I don't think I'm credulous enough to accept that back then you knew what AWS would become. Today, if you're unaware of the scale of what AWS has become, I would question <laughs> whether you still have a functioning pulse. Was it a sudden revelation for you? Was it a dawning realization or how did, that, how did that evolve? How did you, it, when did it you took first a long you? time to actually comprehend exactly what was going on here. And partly is that I, I think I was deeply absorbed into just doing my job day to day. Uh, my family was really young at the time, so I was super busy with five kids and all the things you do when you've got five children and five teenagers and they're going here, there, and everywhere needing lots and lots of uh, attention and driving and feedback and money and all those good kind of things. You have no idea what's in store once your kids get to be teenagers, but. Uh. <laughs> oh, if remember my own childhood, I exactly. can only wince. <laughs> anyway, so I, I was super, super busy with every aspect of life during the early days of AWS and keeping it all in balance, but you, you never get to a certain point and you say, wow, we're, we're suddenly there. It, it's, 
it's ultra incremental. It, it's like if you take a really good hike and you're on this very, very gradual incline. And you never ever say, oh, I'm really exerting myself because I'm going up this hill. But still, there's an incline. You're going up there. And it's, it's very rare that you get to actually like look down and say, oh, we've actually gained considerable altitude doing this. It's, it's been so gradual. And, and also, we, mo we mostly look toward the future here. I, I remember being at some celebration for some milestone of EC2 or S3. And you'd think some companies would make it this big, splashy deal of like, oh, we're here. And hasn't the last 10 years been amazing? We're like, yeah, here, that, that was really great. Now like on to do some other awesome thing like next. And so it kind of kind of always looking toward the future and that that next big thing. But but yeah, you know, back in EC2 and S3 times, it was just you write the blog post and out it goes and you click the button, you hit the post gets published, you get your paycheck, rinse and repeat and 19 years yeah, go by. Yeah, yeah, it it actually does happen like that. And the it, it's been thoroughly enjoyable the, the whole whole time and you you don't always get to like look at the milestones and and really think about them because it's maybe from the outside it, it looks more like a bunch of discrete steps, whereas here it's just been incremental. Especially because we do such fine grained releases sometimes, and like and e even though they are fine grained, occasionally there's the unanticipated one you do, and everybody's like, "Oh, you thought that was a little thing, but that was the final part of the puzzle that now lets me do something kind of amazing." And Actually, can I tell you a funny kind of a secret? I would love to okay, hear, just so, between you, me, and whoever and happens yeah. to be watching this, how so many people could that I, possibly be? I'm actually not very metrics driven, because I, I don't actually know how I would write my blog post any differently if, if I knew detailed metrics on who read what or, or how popular something happened to be. Sorry, but, someone just had a heart attack back in Seattle watching this. <laughs> oh, I, Their I, entire I, vision of what this company no, is about has just shattered to I, bits. I am one of the few that doesn't pay too much attention to post. I, I do look at my Twitter analytics pretty much every couple minutes, but as far as... Um, Guilty. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, they're captivating. Um, I, I don't look at blog post metrics very often, but sometimes the ones that are the most popular are sometimes... They're either surprisingly modest-sized features that we might have been on the bubble of whether it needs a blog post or not, and then, bizarrely enough, when we... The, the rare times when we say we're, we're in the, the long, slow process of deprecating something, those are popular. Like actually, when it says, hey, we're, we're deprecating the old S3 path model or we're taking away EC2 Classic over the next couple of years. It's such th a those... novelty. <laughs> it's wow, you finally found out where an off switch was. I assume you just forgot to build one. I, exactly. So it's kind of interesting that, that the deprecation posts end up being fairly popular. Yeah. Have a hot wing, because I definitely want right. you off balance I'm when you answer this next this question. Be. So you have been a huge fan of Lego for mm -hmm. a long time. You've built examples, demos, you've done all of the leadership principles, though I don't know if you've added the most recent two yet. Not yet. And in recent years, Lego Group has become a reference customer for a bunch of AWS services. And I, I can't shake the feeling that there's some connection between those two things. What is the black market exchange rate between <laughs> Lego store credit and AWS credits? Oh, I, I would love to know that, actually. Um, I've, so we have this really neat role inside of AWS called executive sponsor. And so as an executive sponsor, you get to work with, with a, a few particular customers. And just by total luck, I, got, I was invited to work with Lego, and I've gotten to travel to their headquarters in Billund, Denmark, a couple times. R fascinating little city. I've gotten to go deep into the basement where they have the full archive of all the things they've ever built. And they've had some great success with, with serverless. I, I know that they've given some great presentations at reInvent's past about... Um, they, they have a really spiky model where every six months or so they'll announce a whole bunch of new sets and then at the, the shopping time, I, I think actually November 1st was the last one that was a big deal, they, they said November 1st a whole bunch of really amazing stuff is going to go on sale and every enthusiast around the world wants to go and get that order for the next big cool new thing. Start spamming the refresh key to see if it's live yet. Exactly. And I, I, I'm on several different groups where people compete to get their orders in first. I, I, I'm actually kind of at capacity within, within all of my storage facilities for how much Lego I can own. So I, it turns out there's also no compression algorithm for Lego. Oh, man, there, there is not. And you have to, when you get something new, you have to actually budget in terms of cubic feet for where do you put it after you assemble it. And our next one of these will have to have a hydraulic press, and we'll see if we can fix some of that. Yeah, absolutely, for sure.
Okay, so going back to that first reInvent keynote, now we have this, we have an entire room with probably 100 people in it. We call it the launch war room. It's deep inside the, the, the conference center at, in Las Vegas. And we have these well-coordinated teams and we've got second by second launch checklists, all these interlocks. And it's, it's kind of like a, a NASA launch, basically the, the precision of what happens in the launch war room. That didn't exist for the first reInvent, and we, we had no launch team whatsoever. I mean, we, Andy was going to get up on stage and make a whole bunch of announcements, and not thinking things through at all, I was sitting there in the audience on my laptop on the conference room Wi-Fi, and I was, we, I was using TypePad at the time as my blogging platform. I'm just sitting there, and I pull up the first blog post for what's about to be announced. And then, with, of course, I'm not thinking this through. And I realize, oh, whoever's behind me can see what we're about to launch. And uh, so I, I carefully excused myself out of the, the keynote and, and launched from the, the lobby, I guess it was. But that, that was the level of not actually knowing what was about to happen and not having this entire launch apparatus that we have now. Now, now things are so amazingly sophisticated and planned out and controlled you know, minute by minute, second by second. and. Oh yeah, back, it used to that, be that, that you see the pricing like, API update before the announcement. That things are very coordinated it, these it's, days. It's pretty amazing how much we get online within a matter of seconds. You know, we, we get the, the detail page, we get the console, we get the API docs, we get the API endpoints, we get the what's new, we get the blog posts, we get the social media. That doesn't happen by accident. That happens because a lot of really good people have been getting ready for this for a very long time. Oh yeah, and if you if you, when you don't have that alignment, you, you have your post go up and it's great and the service is live and you click the pricing page and it 404s and it's <laughs> hmm, I this smells a lot like a trap. I wonder what the story is. And I've never gotten yeah. a sense it's intentional, but it's always one of those, let me know exactly how much trouble I'm about to get myself into here. There was one reinvent where I, I think we were kind of on the bubble about whether some new instance type was going to be launched or not. And this was I'm sorry, on the bubble? On the bubble as should it happen, should it not happen. Got it. And I think it was in a deck and it, for, it wasn't removed from the deck. And so we didn't have a blog post for it. And then I don't know if it was Andy or Werner who made the announcement about this new instance type and we didn't have a blog post. And I was totally crushed that we had no post. I like, that was my pride and joy of always having a post for a new announcement. And I had enough good colleagues in the launch war room. I said, okay. I, I will put a, an actual invisible shield around myself and, and I will write a blog post for this instance type in the next 20 minutes. And we had, the, we had this guy, Dave, who was, I think, the EC2 PM at the time. He was there. He's like, Jeff, if you can do it in 20 minutes, I will review it and approve it. And I somehow like locked out the entire world and just cranked out the entire post with, with the, the table of instance types, all the description in 15 minutes. We got it reviewed, got it published. I was like, whew. My record is intact. Jeff, thank you for suffering my slings, arrows, <laughs> and various assorted hot sauces yeah. as we went through it. It's, it's always great to get a chance to talk with it's you. It's been great to catch things. up. Have a great reInvent. I'll do my best. <laughs> this has been Winging It, a show so excellently named you know Amazon had nothing to do with it. I'm Chief Cloud Economist Corey Quinn of the Duckbill Group, and my guest has been Jeff Barr, VP and Chief Evangelist at AWS. Thank you for tolerating our ridiculous nonsense. <laughs> Very brave to eat wings on camera. Although now I'm kind of hungry. I get a, can I get some wings here? No, uh, producer says no, sorry. Guess I'm winging it too. I'm Rudy Chetty, you're watching Live From reInvent. <laughs>